Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. You heard that right. <laughs> Believe it or not, in the 50 plus episodes of Go With The Heat we've had, this is the first one without John. Yep, this is the first one he's ever missed. He's unfortunately not going to be able to make it this week. He's not off the show. No, no, no. He's just, just off this week. Yeah. So we're going to do what we can to fill in the void for him. I imagine John is busy with some of the other music stories that he's had before where they are busy breaking into David Bowie's van. <laughs> <laughs> he's helping Tubbs make some hits. Yes, he needs them. <laughs> Unlike Don Johnson, he didn't need help with the hits. So we're going to do what we can to fill in for John this week. While he's out this week, we are talking about season three, episode five, titled The Good Caller. Caller as in shirt caller, not caller. Not caller as no. in. <laughs> it originally premiered on October 24th, 1986. It was written by Dennis Cooper, who wrote the teleplay for Made for Each Other and also wrote the episode Sons and Lovers. He will have two more episodes that he will write as well before before his time is done. The episode is directed by Mario Di Leo, who also directed When Irish Eyes Are Crying. So we have some veteran staff mm-hmm. here for this episode. They it's, have some good good episodes they've done too. So unlike last week. <laughs> oh God. No, we have a good episode this week. That too. was a train wreck last week. <laughs> before we get started, I can check in so once again each other's lives. And guys, we have to mention it this week because of Miami Vice, and he has been, it was an emphasis of an episode on Miami Vice, mm-hmm. but there was the unfortunate passing of of John Hurd. We had to mention it here in the opening. It's kind of a sad start to our episode that we, that the passing of John Hurd, who, as most people remember, is the dad from Home Alone. Yes, but I feel kind of sad that that's the only thing people know him from because he mm-hmm. had a vast career in movies and TV. Yeah, yeah, he was in a lot of stuff. He was in a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Very wide range mm-hmm. of stuff that he played. I know there's no real transition out of this, but no, but <laughs> John Hurd is hopefully left where Crockett left him on that island in the Keys. Mm-hmm. And I know there isn't any easy way to transition out of there, but we will just say that John Hurd, you'll be missed, and we appreciate yes everything that you did in Home Alone, and John Hughes movies, and then also in Miami Vice. To easily and quietly segue out of that into what is also a sad episode of Miami Vice this week. I cried in this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go break down this episode. We open once again on Hooker Row. You think that the vice, there's some sort of police force in Miami that would help with getting hookers off the street. I'm starting to think maybe the guys of Vice just hang out on Hooker Row for a different reason. (laughs) I don't know. It's feeling awfully strange here. I don't know. They seem very familiar with the Hooker Row. Also, they're parked on the street in that Porsche. You would think they'd be a magnet for all the hookers you mean on the Lamborghini? street. Lamborghini? Oh, yeah. You said a Porsche. No, it is a Porsche. Oh, they're not parked in the... It's not a Lamborghini. Oh, that's right. You're that's right. That's a Porsche. Porsche. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I forgot. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Getting my cars wrong. <laughs> yes. And no one comes up to make a deal? <laughs> no. No, no one. I mean, is it just that they know they all know Don Johnson? They just know the they, they know Crockett. Know that? They've already yeah. made the deals. <laughs> I don't know. It's just the duo Tubbs and Crockett. They're hanging out. They're watching this payphone, as we find out later, is like a common payphone that's used for drug deals. There's this guy who I didn't think was looked like a kid, but he's supposed to be just 17 year old kid. His name's Archie. He looks like a kid, but not not a 17 year old. No. We find all the information out later that he's only 17. His name's Archie. But they're watching this kid. They're watching this phone. This kid's at the phone. He's looking suspicious. And Crockett's just going to go walk by. Tubbs is seeing the car. like he's too busy reading the sports section of the newspaper. Tubbs <laughs> being lazy again. Doesn't want to do his job. So Crockett's just going to go do a walk by just to see what's happening. As he comes walking up, Archie grabs him. He's like, hey, are you this guy? Sorry, I didn't write down the name of the person. He's like, yeah. Like, you got the stuff? Like, it turns into this drug deal. Like. <laughs> <laughs> the kid's got bad luck. Like, also, like Crockett's just like, hey, like I'll just go along with this. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's, that's me. That's me. Yeah, <laughs> you got the stuff, and he puts his hand in his pocket, like he's got inside his jacket, like he's got something. The kid's like, yeah, here. He's like, you, you're supposed to have an envelope for me. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got it right here. He pulls out his badge, mm-hmm. and the kid had given him some heroin, black tar heroin. Yeah, that that he was gonna deliver to someone else. I sorry, I wrote a different the name. He was saying, are you Tootie? <laughs> <laughs> are you duty it was the man that he was l- looking for so right when he grabs archie throws him against the car this other car 
a very ironic and stereotype Hispanic gang members I know, right? come driving up. <laughs> I wonder what gang they're supposed to be in. <laughs> they come driving up like, hey, you shouldn't be selling on our turf. And then Crockett yells out the tubs like, hey, anytime now. You can yeah, come. are you done with your sports section now? Do you want to come help me? <laughs> so they come running over. They pull out their badges, pull out their guns. The kids, because they these ones do look like kids, yes. they run back to their car. They a, cu- a couple of them take off on foot. So Crockett holds down Archie while Tubbs goes and chases down one of the kids. And of course, the only one that he's able to catch up to is another police officer. <laughs> <laughs> Who probably, like in reality, probably let him catch him. Probably like, okay, then I have to tell you, hey, I'm a cop and you're a cop. And Yeah, that's true. It's like, don't shoot at me. I'll let you catch me. Yeah, like, he's and he works the gang unit in Miami-Dade or whatever. So when he catches him, he turns around and flashes his badge, which is, seems like a giant risk for someone in the gang to carry his badge yeah, why on Why do you him. carry your badge with you? <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine there's something where he's like hanging out. Oh, and so like, it falls out. In my pocket and falls, his badge <laughs> falls out. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> After Tubbs sees the badge, we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're still on the street. Crockett is with Archie. And Switek pulls up and he grabs Archie and he takes him with him back to, to the precinct. That's where we find out he's only 17. Switek, meanwhile, is being a jackass. Oh, uh, what else is new? <laughs> he's like making jokes that, t- that Crockett doesn't get. What was he doing? Like doing like a song? Yeah, he's like, like shaking his head. And, and like, he, he was doing the Shaft theme song. Who's the guy? Did you not notice that? No, I did not notice that. Yeah, when he was coming up, he's like, who's the guy who needs a favor? And like doing that. And like Crockett was like, and then he stopped. He's like, never mind. Like, whatever. Yeah, that's what he was doing. He was trying to do like the Shaft theme song, but would like make up his own words. He's such an idiot. No Zito. No, no. No Zito. There's nothing ominous there. He's no, I know. Guy. He's just like, <laughs> in any episodes. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tubbs is talking to the cop that he grabbed. His name is Ramirez. He just graduated about eight months ago. He's 23. We know Miami Vice. He's dead. Like, just write him I off. I know. He's such a baby, too. Yeah. He's, he just got out of the academy. He said all the triggers that we need to know when he's gonna when people are going to die. He just got out of the academy, and then they right away were like, the gang unit pinged him. Like, you're young enough to go into high schools. And that's the other thing that we learned here is that these are all high school gangs. Mm-hmm. Not adults. These are uh, high 15, school. like 14 to 17 year old high school kids that are running these gangs. And when we say kids, when we get to meet Count Walker, he's a kid. He is a kid. Yeah, like <laughs> literally a kid. He's also talking to Lee Atkins, who's or Lieutenant Atkins, the head of the gang unit, who is I have a problem with him. I'll bring bring that up later. I, I think a- he's useless. <laughs> he doesn't do anything in this episode. No, no. And that's what that's part of my issue with him is he's also shows very little remorse. Yeah, I know. Right. (laughs) For any of it. I don't know. (laughs) Crockett pulls up and they're talking. uh, Now they're all talking. And Atkins is just saying there's a a big gang problem here in, in this part of Miami and it's growing. So it's really big problem now. And they're dealing in heroin which is making it even worse because they're dying from ODing. Mm-hmm. So now you have all these, and essentially every high school has its own gang. It's like yes. a freaking West Side Story up in here. Yes, every high school has their own gang and the community is sick of it. They're tired of it. They are the ones who are, were calling. That's why Crockett and Tubbs were out there because somebody had called and complained about that payphone being used for drug mm-hmm. deals. And like they're getting a lot of pressure from, they said they're getting a lot of pressure from downtown to investigate it. So that's why they were there. The gang that they're that Archie is connected with through Luther, and then we'll, we find out later Count Tootie. Walker. <laughs> yeah, and Tootie. Tootie, who didn't show up. We don't know where Tootie went, but <laughs> is they're called the regular fellas. I don't know. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna comment on the gang names because I feel like they're all really stupid. Yeah, the apostles is the uh, other gang. The other gang apostles that is the Hispanic gang, right? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. yeah. So I have a question for Miami Vice writers. Like you are very creative with your people names, but you're Gang names need some work. They could they <laughs> all they needed to do was watch the Warriors and they could come up with some amazing <laughs> gang names, right? Because there's like 150 gangs in the Warriors. <laughs> well, you know, the apostles kind of look like something from the Warriors. Yeah, exactly. My, they look like the, the ones that go around the roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> Now everyone's going to head over to the precinct. The duo are interrogating Archie. Now, Archie, you find out here, he is not a real gang member. He's hooked up with Tootie and Luther. Luther's a close friend of his. He just needed some extra money. He's actually got a scholarship to go play yes. football. And, or some scouts are coming to the mm-hmm. game. He's got a scholarship writing on that. He is a clean kid. He just needed some money. He's poor. 
Yes, he's so poor. He was, yeah, he's w- poor, and his mom, his grandma works like some job that doesn't make very much money, and he's crying because he's like, "I messed up, and now if my coach finds out about this, I'll never be able to play again, and it's basically going to ruin his life if he gets yeah. caught." Yeah, yeah. So it's going to ruin everything because he got caught. All he was doing it for was money. He didn't even know what the package was. He was just his only job was to drive between Tootie and Luther. He was yep. just supposed to move to move these packages. He didn't even know what they were. Tubbs. He's hard on him, though. Yeah, Tubbs doesn't believe it. You could tell. Tubbs, like, when the kid starts talking, he's like, what are you going to do, cry punk? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he's already crying, Tubbs. Jeez. <laughs> Apparently, Tubbs oh, doesn't like him because he's not a hooker. If he was a hooker <laughs> then, and he had a sob story, then Tubbs would feel sorry for him. <laughs> but he's not a hooker, so, you know, no, I don't feel sorry for you. <laughs> However, Crockett it has, it has piqued Crockett's interest because he's talking about playing football, and we know that Crockett has a history of being a football star in college Mm -hmm. and he talks about the reason why he needed the money was because he needed cleats because his cleats were worn down you could already tell that you have recruiters coming oh okay you know you got you trying to get a scholarship like oh okay it's already piqued his interest on that meanwhile Tubbs is like yeah it's a story you hear a thousand times i'll buy it and you know what we never really hear Tubbs ever really admit otherwise throughout the rest of the episode either yeah now, we could talk about that later. That upsets me. <laughs> in the middle of their interrogation, Switek busts in and says there's an Ed McCain to see the lead investigator in this case. And so that's Crockett. So Crockett goes to talk to Ed. Now, I'm going to stop right here real fast because we're filling in for John. Mm-hmm. And John normally does all of our research back. So I did. I, I can't do the research that John does. So that's well, why no, I mean, he does do some stellar yeah. <laughs> deep diving in the Internet trying to find these people. <laughs> yeah. So I. I didn't find nearly as much as what John would find when it comes to, yeah. to, to information about the guest the, stars. The guest stars, but this is where we have our first guest star, and that this is Ed is played by Charles Dutton. Now Charles Dutton is a actually a really interesting person, and I found a little bit of information on him. Like I said, not as detailed as what John will do. Maybe John will like put together some stuff for us <laughs> next time before he. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to miss one. He'll put, he'll put together notes for me on this. Uh, Charles S. Dutton, he, you may recognize him from, he did a long stints on The Practice and Without a Trace. So he was on those two shows for a really long time. He was actually, when he was 17, he was, he, he's a boxer. And mm-hmm. when he was 17, he got into a fight. And, when he, and the person that he was fighting died. It was like a street fight. And the person died and he served seven years in oh prison. Oh my God. And then when he came out, that's when he got into acting and he went into Broadway after getting out of jail and then worked his way through Broadway. He was nominated for a couple of Tony Awards and then transitioned over to TV and into movies. You may remember him from, as I mentioned, from The Practice or Without a Trace. He also played Fortune in the movie Rudy. I remember him from his own show called Rock mm-hmm. that used to be on Fox. He mm-hmm. was a garbage man. Oh, I remember that remember, show now. Remember, it was now. him and his brother. It was like mm-hmm. him and his wife. And I can't remember her name, but she was... Yeah, I remember. And the bro- the brother was younger and he was a musician. And mm-hmm. it, that was his, it was called Rock. Yeah. And at one point in the show, he becomes... He runs for like city council. I don't remember that. Like two, I used to watch that show. So. <laughs> He's got a great m- movie list, though. Yeah. Other than just playing Fortune and Rudy and then having his own show and then also being a regular character in other shows. He was also in movies like Menace to Society. He was in A Time to Kill. Too. Really? Yeah, and wow. a whole host of other movies. So he was actually... He's got a, a big, a illustrious career. Met him. So that's everything on Charles Dutton. Again, not as good as what John would pull for us. But <laughs> Dutton is a really super interesting guy. Yeah. Like he's lived a really interesting life. Especially the part where it's like an accidental death in a fight and then sort of seven years in prison for That's it. crazy, yeah. The other guest star that we've already seen him, he's playing Lieutenant Atkins. And his name is John Spencer. Now, John Spencer doesn't have any cool stories like Charles Dutton. <laughs> Why don't I say that with a cool story? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he pulled himself yeah. out. Oh, yeah, like, like know, a rags uh, to riches, mm-hmm, bring yourself yeah. out of the gutter kind of story, maybe. John Spencer, you will definitely recognize him if you're a fan of the West Wing. Mm-hmm. He was on... He was on the West Wing for... Mm-hmm. All like that's I think the whole run. He even won a primetime Emmy for his mm-hmm. role in the West Wing. Um, and then he's he's like the cop guy. Mm-hmm. He was in Copland, The Rock, The Negotiator. He was in War Games, like, and always the same guy. Like, it's like he plays the same <laughs> nonchalant, uncaring lieutenant no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> who has no stake in anything. He's just kind of there. <laughs> well, back to the episode. Ed, Charles Dutton. Mm-hmm. Ed 
is explaining to Sonny that the kid is actually a really good kid, that Archie is a great kid. He may have been mixed up in something he shouldn't have been this time, but his mom works at a half, or his grandma yeah. works at a halfway house. He's a great kid. He's got a good scholarship lined up. Like, work with me. Work with Ed. Work with Archie. He's a good kid. Don't, you know, you don't uh, push him so hard. Don't think that he's this hardcore street drug dealer or something like that. Also, he, it's he's like a good kid. He's trying to say, don't throw his life away over this. And that's what's going to happen if you do this yeah. over something so trivial. And he even said, like, hey, if we had known, if I had known he needed shoes, I would have took up a collection for him and we would have bought him the shoes. That's how what a good kid he is. Too proud to ask for help. That pride thing. Pride thing is going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is also this the part where we mentioned with Ramirez, nine months out of the academy, only 23 years old, the young kid with bright eyes, he's dead. <laughs> this is also when we realized with Archie, like young kid, possibly to get out of the ghetto, but get a full he's gonna scholarship. He's going to go places. He's a good kid. He's got, mm-hmm. like, he's got like, he's got a way out of it. No, Sonny has know. latched onto him. He, he's buddies with him. Yeah, that's a death sentence if Sonny likes you. I know. <laughs> Everything he touches. No. We have one fast scene at the precinct before we leave from there where just Atkins is laying out who's in charge of the fellas. That there's Count Walker and Luther and Tootie and that th- those are the people <laughs> that also, they are. those pictures they have, those are very suspiciously <laughs> look like regular headshots that some model took or something. <laughs> Very strange. They also lay out that they want to use Archie to finish up the deal. So whatever deal he was supposed to do, go finish it up, get on record that this deal, that way they'll go bust it down. Yeah. So they're going to use Archie one more time, but they're going to cut him a deal that if he cooperates, he will... They'll they'll, make it go away. Yeah. They'll make it go away. And that's like, it's very clearly the deal. Like Mm -hmm. Castillo basically asked Croc, do you want to do this? Do you think it's a good idea? And, and Croc, yeah, I, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, basically. And so they're like, yeah. okay, we'll go forward with it. And you use them. And and he has to, that's what he had to do first. But that was supposed to be it. He was supposed to be done. So the next day at the, at the drug house, at, at Luther's house, they're going to have Archie. They're prepping him. Like what he's going to do is he has his instructions where he's going to take the bag up. He's going to say that the apostles almost broke it up, but he was still able to get the money. But he still has the drugs, too. Mm-hmm. So he's just going to give it all back to them. Archie goes walking up. The ladies are there and the duo are there. Now and the, also, I think Switek was oh, yeah, there, yeah, too. And Switek, all there, basically. Yeah, and then around the corner yeah. is like the Miami PD because it's yeah. going to be a big bust. The ladies have their own problems. <laughs> <laughs> Bums are trying to pee on their cars. <laughs> Truth like, come on, let me go find you some bushes to pee in, honey. <laughs> I appreciate that because they're not street cops. They're like, just pee in the street. I don't care. Just do it over there. Yeah. They're not going to like give them a bad time. Like they don't care. Just don't pee on my car. (laughs) Archie does what he's supposed to do. He goes walking up. He says he almost got ripped off. But Luther's like, don't do it here. Take this other person and you guys go around in the alley. Don't do it right right here at the door. And so Crockett's like, well, I don't know what's going on here. So Crockett does something really dumb here too, Why right? did he do that? I cannot figure that out. Why would he go and like go hey, do what he does? I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah, because Crockett comes, he follows them down in the alley. Then when he sees that the exchange is going to happen, he just he even yells out like, Archie, what are you doing over here? Like, yeah, like what the heck? He like doesn't he, even pretend like he doesn't know him. Like he just happens to walk around the corner or something. I guess I guess that it's supposed to be that he thinks maybe Archie's trying to get away, trying to pull a fast one on them. So he's mm-hmm. going down this like that Archie's letting it happen in the alleyway because he doesn't want the police to see it. So mm-hmm. like he's over there like he's going to break it up. And then it's not until after it all goes down that because, uh, you know, as we go on to learn, Archie like saves his life. The guy that he's with pulls a gun. Archie dives and tackles him. And then the duo shoot and kill that kid. Who was that Luther? It might have been Luther and they didn't shoot and kill him. But I had a hard time figuring out who was, who? was Luther in the house. Because then when it happens, like they all rush in and they yeah, that's they true. bring down the whole house. Way. There's a shootout. Mm-hmm. I think it's someone else who gets shot and killed. But it might just be Luther who gets hurt and he just goes down. Oh, okay. Because Archie tackles him. Mm-hmm. Archie gets hurt too, like bruises his chest doing it. Um, but Crockett is really fast. Yeah. Hey, you saved my life. Yes. That was a bold move that, that, that you did. You probably saved my life by tackling him and making it so that he wouldn't hit me when he fired. Now, at this point, Archie should be done. He set up the deal. They busted down the drug house. Archie saved mm-hmm. Crockett's life. Yes. They even speak to the state attorney. He comes and he says. So Pepin shows up. Yes. There is a there's a body. They find some bodies inside that house that they that they broke up and everything. And so they, some OD'd 
bodies. And so they're there, they're looking at it and then they go out and he asks him, Crockett is like, what, what about this kid? He's, you know, Archie, he's done all this stuff. And he's like, and I take it, he, you want him to walk. And he's like, yeah, he's done everything he was supposed to do. And he, we owe him our lives. He's like, okay, that's fine. I can't get at him any, anything. He's not, and there's nothing I can do useful with them anyway. So yeah, I agree. He's like, okay, we got a deal. He's like, yeah, we got a deal. He's done. There was no mincing words. That kid is done. Yes, he's done. Yeah, there's no way that you can hide and be like, no, you misinterpreted what I said. Pepin clearly says, yes, the kid's done. I don't need him anymore. You can let him off. Crockett feels good. They let him go home. Archie so. feels good. Yeah, he goes home. Yep, everything's good. Should be good. Should be. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the precinct, Pepin is the state attorney. He's interrogating Luther and Luther's saying the same story basically archie says like it's my cousin's house and all i do is drive a car i don't even know what they do there and he doesn't know anything that's that's happening at the house there was someone there was a voice on the answering machine and they ask ramirez to review it and ramirez says yes that's for sure count walker the head of the fellas mm -hmm. which is who they're ultimately trying to bring down but everything seems to be going the way that it should be that they're going to get luther they're going to try him as an adult they have the the information from the bust and from Archie. It seems like everything should be going as planned. Now, Pepin wants Crockett and Tubbs to testify in court. And he's like, no way. Crockett fights that immediately. I am not t testifying in open court because we're going to go see Count Walker the next day. They we have, have a, a meeting. meeting with him before mm -hmm. that happens. So we can't do that yeah. because that will blow our cover. And Pepin is not happy. He's nervous. He doesn't want, we doesn't want him to get off. It feels like if there's no cops there to sell the story about what happened and to like, testify, then he'll get off. <laughs> exactly exactly so and a lot of that depends on this next scene that we go to where the duo have their meeting with count walker now we have this first we have the count walker montage oh it should be noted that but at the end of the conversation with pepin and the other what's the lieutenant atkins is that his name mm -hmm. they say like you guys have no chance with count walker because you're too old yeah good luck with that it's not going to work and you're going to end up testifying anyway so just did I to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> First, we get this great montage. Yes. And this is something that, I, that I've noticed that we were talking about while we were watching the episode. Miami Vice's worst criminals, the most ruthless gangs in Miami are children, teenagers. Yes, the teenage gangs and the teenage uh, uh, assailants are the worst. So we have a few episodes. We have a, lum a Lombard episode where the, the transfer of power is going to the kid. He acts like a kid. We have the... He goes get ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> we have the No One Lives Forever episode with kids. And I know that you mentioned that part of that is they don't have anything to lose. Like they're young and stupid. I just felt like it's like they're it, that's to show that they're young and um, not spontaneous, but they just have no they no no like uh, inhibitions. They have no no one there to tell them you're an idiot. This is gonna work. They just mm -hmm. go off all off of what they want to do. There's no where my problem is is that the vice writers have very ruthless South American gangs that like kill everyone that they come in contact with. And they don't hold a candle to the children gangs. No. They're way worse. Also, which, which episode is the one where um, they hold up on that, what is an abandoned building, a building and it's got bean rains in it? That's oh. also another young gang. And yeah. they shoot they shoot people and they rape women. The maze. And, yes, yeah. the maze. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That episode is just them being, they're just young and reckless and stupid. And so they just have no, they have no like value to anybody. They just mm -hmm. kill them and get rid of it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why they make it that way. But. <laughs> By the time the mon because this montage is brutal. There are armed robberies. Mm -hmm. They are jumping people. They're, they're doing people. drug deals all over the yeah. place. Except for the time where they probably they run away from grandma hitting them with a broom. So that's well, the hey, time. Hey, grandma, where you don't mess with ruthless. grandmas, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's bad. And then in every case, the filming, so the credit to the director in this, they show little kids watching them. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time something's happening, there's a bunch of little kids around and they're watching it yes. happen. So they also have, they show parts where it's like the teenagers are taking care of the little kids. Like they're giving them money and they're buying yeah. them stuff. So it's like trying to signal, because in the we're talking mid 80s here, mm -hmm. where the peak of fear is t you're losing your teenager to a gang. Yeah. So what they're doing is grooming them, right? The kids. Mm -hmm. So that they can use them later. And in pop culture reference and people sitting at home watching the episode of Miami Vice, like, oh, I'm so scared every day that little Jimmy, I'm going to lose little Jimmy because he's going to join some gang. Yes. And so they're doing this. They're just playing, playing to the fears. Playing on all the fears. of Yeah, exactly. When we come to the end of the montage, 
it's at a park. The people are playing basketball. There's some other kids around. And Crockett and Tubbs are there. And, and Walker. Walker it looks like a baby. He is a baby. 15. Especially next to Crockett, who's looking like a real old man. Hey. <laughs> He's next to a 15-year-old. <laughs> Walker's got a stretch limo. He's got a couple bodyguards that roll around with him. Walker is like, I'm not king of the gang. I'm king of the ladies. <laughs> Can we just discuss that Walker's ridiculous? <laughs> Like, I'm sorry. It's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It, there isn't anyone that could just slap that kid around. It just can't be someone to smack him around a couple of times and then knock it out of him. He's a, he's a little kid. And he's like, yes, he's going around in a limo. He's picking up the lady. But every time I'm like, he's just a little kid playing dress up or something. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And I, I was thinking when we got to this point, because... Tubbs and Crockett are doing their normal Cooper and Burnett deal here. Not going over so well, though. <laughs> we want to get in on your deal, basically. And so we, we're we going to buy a whole bunch and yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, the things that seems to work on adults, but not on children. And I was thinking, isn't this the point in time when 21 Jump Street should take over? Yes. <laughs> that's exactly what should be happening. We need Johnny Depp to show up and be like. Uh, Shouldn't they get R Richard Grieco to go hey, talk to these kids? No, Richard Grieco can stay out of it. <laughs> <laughs> he ruined the show. They need Johnny Depp and um and Dumb DeLuise's son. <laughs> I can't remember his name. <laughs> Peter DeLuise, thank you. And and Holly Robinson, uh, Pete. Yeah, Holly Robinson to yeah, go. Exactly. And a guy with a giant feather for an earring. I don't remember his name in real life. <laughs> I remember his name in the show. <laughs> yes, I love my, I love Twenty One Jump Street. Of course you do. Of course you love 21 Jump Street because everything else 80s related, you seem to know everything about well, it. Well, I mean, what could go, what could be better? It's a cop show about undercover teenage cops in high schools. And it's got Johnny Depp in it. <laughs> Cream of the crop. <laughs> Anyways, yes. But no, no, we got these two old geezers trying to break the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I was thinking, like, why would walker do business with them it makes no sense they should have you think they would use get another young guy or i don't mm -hmm. know something yeah they send another person to go talk i bet young you person they should you know what them. they should have done they should have sent the ladies because even if you're a teenage boy you cannot resist trudy or gina in the oh yeah in their and hooker walker gear. says i may be under 18 and i don't do business with people under the age of 18 because he sees through it right away yeah he says because because people who are over eight and he's right people who are over the age of 18 they have a lot to lose Mm -hmm. These kids don't have anything to lose. They're kids. They can't be tried as adults. He also says that anyone over the 18 smells like the man, except for the ladies. Well, yeah. Which I is mean, why they should have sent Gina and Trudy. That's what I'm saying. Gina and Trudy would have been in like that. They would have been done. <laughs> this deal would have been closed. They sent stinky, <laughs> <laughs> smells like the man. <laughs> and by the way, Tubbs says nothing in this episode. I'm just saying. No, he's still re in recovery mode, Melissa. He oh, got beat true. up real bad. And who knows what else happened when we, the camera wasn't around while he was he at He did Bolton. lose the love of two weeks, too. <laughs> Don't let that happen. Forget about that happening. It's a very ominous ending where Walker just, he takes some money and then he says, people want plants and plants need sunshine and I have the best sunshine around. And then, then he, creepily rolls up his window with a smile And then drives away. Like, yeah, it's so that's weird. It. Yeah, so there goes their deal with Walker. They're going to have to testify in open court now. Where are his parents? <laughs> like, seriously, where are your parents? <laughs> Later that night, so now the deal with Walker has fallen through. Later that night, Crockett shows up at Archie's house. Unannounced. And, no, yeah, <laughs> just shows up. Ed's there. Archie's grandma. He's just going to see Archie, just basically to say thanks. Like, you saved my life. And I, I really love football players. And so I'm here to tell you about how I used to be a football player. I love that Archie was not impressed. <laughs> he was like, cool. <laughs> That's cool, man. Like, well, that's good for you. But uh, he gives them the money for the cleats. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "What do I? When do I have to pay you back?" And he's like, "No, you don't have to pay me back. It's just a gift." It's and then gift. he gives them a football from when he ran a, like an eighty-five yard touchdown in the Gator Bowl. Yes, and he talks about that he was also he played the same position, right? Yeah, he plays wide receiver. And it was a touchdown from the Gator Bowl, which isn't saying much because that's just two Florida teams playing each other. Cause that means but I mean, doesn't the kid have footballs? <laughs> he plays football. Why mm -hmm. would he not have his own football? <laughs> At first, I was like, this is stupid. He's giving him a football. Here you go. Here's a football. Like, you don't have enough money to buy shoes. So you must not have a football either. <laughs> you go. Archie is gracious. And he also says, you should come to the game. He invites Crockett to, to the game. That's he happening also next says Thursday. he can't take the ball. He's like, yeah. you can't take this ball. He goes, oh, no, I'd be, it would be collecting dust if you hadn't saved me. <laughs> Just like Crockett, collecting <laughs> dust. 
<laughs> he saved it. Elvis was going to eat it. That's what was happen. <laughs> Anyways, it's a special bonding moment between and Archie right and then Crockett. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, she's dead. This kid's going to die. Why? <laughs> the next day. The duo are driving and Ramirez gives them a call on the car phone and says that the apostles are planning to strike back for the deal that that the, the payphone deal because they didn't know that it was the cops. Well, they, they did, but they didn't. They're not putting together that like maybe they're working with the cops or something like no, that. No, they don't. No, no. no. So they're just going to strike back. They're against striking the back fellas. because they were trying to deal in their territory. Yeah. yeah. Ramirez calls the duo and says, go meet me at this coffee shop. As soon as they hang up, Crockett calls Pepin and tells Pepin. We're not coming to court. We have another lead. We have another. What they think is that Ramirez. Ramirez also says he might have some information about a way to get into Walker too. It's like we're we're gonna go chase this down. Pepin is very Bitter. upset about that. <laughs> Mad, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, this is gonna cost me my case. Essentially, he's like, well, let let us do it our way. That's what Crockett was like. Let us do it our way, which will uh, actually ends up being true. They should have let them do it their way. Yeah, I mean, it, in in the end, yes, maybe. That yeah, might be up for, for a debate. So when they make it over to the coffee shop, R R Ramirez comes in. He's still undercover, but he says that the apostles are making a gasoline bomb and they're going to go strike against the fellas. Put a loose tail on him. He'll call when he's got more information. Ramirez runs back out to the car. They open up the trunk. You see that the bomb is in the trunk. Now, this is this is some debate here. Tubbs just kind of casually says, hey, will you look at that? And Crockett turns around and yells. Like, no, or stop. No, or, Ramirez. He yelled mm -hmm. the name. Ramirez. Yeah. yeah. And the pers is this person up on a bridge fires a grenade out it's of a, a grenade, grenade bomb, launcher, yeah. hits the gasoline bomb, causes the car to explode, and for gasoline to be shot on other people, including a man inside of an ice cream truck that had just happened to be parked there. Crockett yes. goes out and rescues that man. Yes. But the car has been, it's blown oh, to bits. it's gone. Now. Yes. And the yeah. window blows out of the restaurant. And Tubbs gets a little bit of glass on his face. Mm -hmm. Now, I will have some questions about Tubbs nonchalant when you look at that. Do you just kind of casually say, would you look at that when someone's holding a grenade launcher on a bridge? Because at first you're like, I don't, what did he see? And then it wasn't until later on that they say, like Crockett says, like, and then we saw him holding the grenade launcher. <laughs> I mean, I think Crockett has the appropriate response. He yeah. turns, he's like, oh my God. Ramirez, and then it's like, psh, you know, yeah. meanwhile, tubs, 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 tubs. Like, <laughs> nah, would you look at that? That guy's going to blow something up. I don't know. Or he's like, hey, look at that. Why don't you be more a little bit urgent about this? And maybe he saw it even earlier. Maybe yeah. he didn't say anything. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, the car blows up and it's not good. No, when we come back from commercial, Cro Crockett is talking to a cop. He says that he saw that they had a grenade launcher. They fired it. Another officer comes up and says that a man named Ed McCain is on his car phone. Now I have another question. Do people do other police officers just answer his car phone? I guess they must. <laughs> Does he expect other cops to do that for him? I guess. Yeah, like, hey. <laughs> I don't know. How do you get that number? I want <laughs> Croc is like trying to tell him, like, I don't have time to talk right now. You know, I'm kind of in the middle of something. But Ed is adamant. So you need to come down to the high school right now. Archie has been arrested again. So I don't know why is at why this is happening at the high school. I don't know. Maybe because he was just at school. Mm -hmm. And so they just like arrested him there. I don't know that part. And I also, isn't it like before they leave that Lieutenant Atkins comes and he's like, what happened? And like Crockett's telling him and he's like, well, what happened to Ramirez? And he's like, well, they took him away in an ambulance. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be morbid, but like, how do you ain't survive in that explosion? <laughs> well, and Tubbs and Atkins leave together to go to the hospital. But I mean, what's him. there to go to the hospital? He's got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no way he can't. You can't even put him back together after that explosion. <laughs> He's everywhere. Like, what is there to like, take to the hospital? Why are we supposed to be surprised that he died? It was a gasoline bomb, too. So that's what I'm saying. Like, everybody was incinerated. <laughs> There should have been nothing left. There was nothing to take to the hospital. Well, while they <laughs> they go to help assemble him <laughs> <Apparently>. <laughs> at the hospital. And Crockett takes off to go over to Eastside High. It's another little confusing thing. I'm not 100% sure. But I think what's happening is that the news is explaining that six people were killed or seven people, something like that, were killed in an explosion in a parking lot. And then one person injured. Including an innocent person, basically, yeah. is what they're saying. Like, yeah. the other ones were gang members. They're not innocent. They blew up. But they're suspecting that the gang is from Eastside High. Mm -hmm. So the police are there at the high school now. Yep. But the high school's like in riot mode, almost. Because the 
community is mad because they've never like the high school apparently the high school hasn't done anything the police haven't ever done any, really done anything so they're like rioting because of that which mm-hmm. leads to the reaction that you get from Pepin where he's like I have to do something and they're pretty consistent throughout the whole episode of the people in that neighborhood are fed up with mm-hmm. what's happening every time there's an explosion or a shooting or yeah, police and there's activity there's clips people there here and there of them speaking like to neighborhood people and them saying like this is ridiculous and it's not mm-hmm. safe and no one can live here like this. Inside, Pepin is talking to Archie and he's explaining to him how to wear a wire. Crockett comes in and is like, hey, what's going on here? And Pepin's like, oh, in exchange for not prosecuting him for that deal, those 12 grams that he had, he's going to wear a wire and go set up Walker because I really wanted Walker. And Crockett's like, excuse me? Yeah, but we had a deal already. <laughs> he's done his part. And we saw that deal. It was very clear. Yep. On what it was. And Pepin doesn't say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. No, he says like, but things have changed. I'm taking it back. And if you had come to court, maybe we, uh, he talks about Luther got off. Mm -hmm. They let him go because you guys weren't there. They're not going to try him as an adult. He's getting out of it, basically. Crockett's obviously very upset. Because also they want to charge, if he doesn't want to do it, they'll charge him with trafficking because he had so much, which is a bigger Which is going to ruin everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Crockett pulls Pepin outside. They start arguing really hard and... Pepin says, I don't, I'm not going to talk to you, officer. I'm going to talk to your boss. Mm-hmm. When he says that, Crockett obviously gets very mad. Like, no, you're dealing with me because you made the deal with me. Yeah. And then Castillo comes walking around the corner. And now Castillo, someone needs to give Castillo a high five. Yeah. Here. He comes walking over and, and Pe- Pepin is like, okay, thank you. You're here. I want to talk to you. He's like, that's why I talk to my officer. Yeah. My officer. My officer. I'm going to talk to him. Now, he doesn't have good things to say. No, he does say, he says, when when Crockett says, like, is there anything that you can do? Because, you know, says, I could probably, if you, if you're really, if you really want me to, I can go fight it out if you want me to. But I can run it up. I can run it up the, the chain of command. And then Crockett's like, do you think it'll matter? He's like, no, I don't think it'll matter, but I can. He's at least honest. Yeah, though. he's honest. Yeah. Yeah, but he's got nothing. He's got no good news. No, it's not good news. But yeah, but he's not saying, hey, I don't, I, I don't, basically he's saying, I don't agree with it either, but this yeah. is what I have to do. And then when they come out of that meeting, Crockett goes to talk to Archie and Castillo goes and talks to Pepin and he says, no handshakes, just give me a signed paper. He's like, no, we're not having any more handshake deals with you. you yeah. have to, I have to see signed papers or nothing and mm-hmm. nothing happens. People should tell the state attorney's office about Castillo. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Not just that he is a hardened former CIA CIA, and not just that he's a hardened, strong captain of the Miami Vice, Mm -hmm. but that he is also a veteran samurai and (laughs) will seek revenge against you and you will not be able to stop it. (laughs) Straight ninja. He will ninja your ass. Wait for you in the parking lot. But he's a by the book man and he does what he's supposed to do. Because they ha- can't find out about his ninja past. Yeah. Everything protected. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah. Uh, it's nothing without principles, that man. So, yeah. Inside, Ed and Crockett are both talking to Archie and telling him he does not have to do this. Ed is mad. Yes. Ed is extremely mad. And he is working hard on Archie to tell him, don't do this. This is the worst case scenario. Even if they bust you for trafficking, we'll go to court. Even if you have to go to jail, it is better than dying. I know you have all your heart set on this scholarship, but this is a bad decision. And Crockett is saying the same thing. He is helping Ed talk to Archie, but Archie says, I'm going to do the right thing. I, it was my fault. I'm the one that did it. Mm-hmm. I chose to make the wrong decision. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just going to do it. And I, I can't lose like what all the stuff I've worked for. I can't lose it. To no avail. And now Ed is pissed. And so Ed leaves. Well, because they kick him out. Because Pepin says, are you his guardian? And mm-hmm. Ed says, no. And he says, and you have to get out. And he said, we have to talk to your grandma before. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to talk to your guardian before we can do this. They kick Ed out. He's mad. Crockett talks to Archie alone and says, let's try and say, I told you to open the trunk. And then, so therefore it was an illegal search. And then it'll, the evidence will be inadmissible to court. And then you won't have to go through this. He like, says, like, you just don't don't worry about it. I'll just take care of it. I'll just say. It was only he's going to sacrifice his, this, yeah. like a hit on his yes. career yeah. for, for this. Oh, his reputation, everything, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And Archie says, no, I could not let you do that. That's not right. We, we both know it's not right. Archie's, he's committed. He's doing it. He's going in. We see outside the high school that he's going to go down. He's going to go get wired up. Tubbs and Atkins show up. They say that Ramirez has died in surgery. They must have. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they must have lost the the plans on how to put them back <laughs> together. together. Yeah. <laughs> and it should be noted that also that they've told Archie this entire time, but but Pepin won't hear it. 
because they want Archie to go wear a wire and they want they want um, Count Walker to confess. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, you're never going to get it. This is a waste of time. You're never going to get a confession out of him. And mm-hmm. then you're going to die after because they're going to kill you. They're going to know that you're wearing a wire. Yeah. yeah. So we have one stopover before we kind of, it's pretty much the last scene of the episode. Now, there is one more scene. So this is pretty much the last scene. There's a weird scene at the end of this episode. But this, we're coming up on the bus scene, the big scene. And this one got me. I wasn't prepared for how well how this was going to go. So we get to this last scene. Now it was, it was a good build up to this. So I'm gonna co- I'm gonna cover that. In my final thoughts. The vice team is spread out, and they at this ice cream parlor. I don't know because <laughs> you know kids. They're kid drug dealers, like so they're the eating ice cream. Like yeah. a drive-in ice cream place or something? Yeah. Archie is talking to Walker. Walker's bodyguard is there. He's trying to talk to him about a deal, and Walker says, let's go for a ride. So now it's Croc, really... It's like, crap, don't get in the car. So now they're really afraid for what's going to happen to Archie. He gets into the car, and they start driving down. And this is where things actually start to work out, and you start to think that he's got it, that maybe it's going to happen. Now, Archie's really nervous in there, but he's say, he keeps explaining that he can get the hookup back with Luther. He knows about... He can get into the house again. He wants to set up... What he says is he wants the same thing that Luther had. He mm-hmm. wants to do that kind of stuff. That big of a setup. That big yeah. of a number. And he's got someone to help him and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And Walker says, Luther ain't nothing. I gave him everything. And so they got it on, on... on. They got it. Yep. They got his confession that everything came from Walker. But then Walker is real suspicious. Like, why do you keep mentioning Luther? And they lunge at him and they rip off his shirt and they see that he's got a wire. Now the vice team is racing... To catch up because they're listening to, to, to it happen. To, yeah, they know what's going mm-hmm. on. They know they're listening to it happen. Pepin is trying to say we should let it play out, let it play out. Crockett wants to just rush in and save him, but they while they're racing in because he's that that that's what he's trying to do. Yeah, while they're racing in, they pull back his shirt. They see the wire. Walker's bodyguard shoots and fires and hits Archie. They're able to get the limo to stop. They get everyone out. Walker immediately says it was him that shot him. He's pointing to his bodyguard. He tells his bodyguard, throw the gun out. Throw the gun yeah. out. <laughs> he, he has a wire on. Why would you shoot him with the... <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> they get everyone out of the car. They get him handcuffed. Crockett goes running into the limo. He pulls up Archie and Archie is dead. Well, he thinks for a minute, maybe, because he, he tells uh, Tubbs, get an ambulance. Tom yells out, get an ambulance! <laughs> <laughs> yells out to get an ambulance. <laughs> then he comes back in and Crockett's holding him, like cradling him. And then he's like, no, he's gone. Yeah, and he's then dead. Crockett like, like, just lets him go, drops him, <laughs> and starts to get very upset. Yeah, he's and very angry. upset. And... That's pretty much the episode. They've gotten Walker. They did what Pepin wanted. They got Walker. They bought down this gang at the expense of one of the good kids. Mm-hmm. Cost him his life. And Ramirez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a young cop. Mm-hmm. Too. That's what this has cost. Meanwhile, Walker is still saying, you can't arrest me. I'm the great Count Walker. You haven't done anything wrong. He's doing the cocky kid thing because yeah. they got to go way over the top. My advice has to go way over the top <laughs> on that. We get it. They're kids. And then really the last scene is, is you see Crockett. It's at in the evening. He goes to Archie's house. He knocks on the door. Ed opens the door. Crockett says, I'm just here to pay my respects. And Ed says, and then you won't hold it against me if I don't invite you in. Then Archie's grandma comes and hands him back his football. Then weirdly. <laughs> Crockett slowly starts to walk away. And it's like, this is so hard. He really tried to do the right yeah, thing. He, for he, once, he did the right thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like normally he's like, whatever. We just go with. We, we don't just care sacrifice about the consequences. Him. Yeah. Yeah. But he did. He really tried to do the right thing, and it just yeah. never worked. And then Atkins comes pulling up. And it's like, hey, good job out there. We, the, the streets are quiet. The gangs aren't out right now. You did good work. See you later. He just drives away. <laughs> like, meanwhile, hey, Atkins, you lost a, you lost a person too, right? <laughs> also, how did you time that so well that you just drove up and talked to him? I don't know. And how did he know where away? he was? Like, it must have been like <laughs> Tubbs told him. Like, hey... <laughs> Because Tubbs said, like, you want to go get some dinner or something, I mm-hmm. think, right? And then Crockett's like, no, I don't want to do any, I, you know, I have yeah. some stuff I need to do, whatever. Yeah. And then yeah. Crockett sadly takes his football <laughs> and throws it in the trash and walks back to his car. And then that's the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. So it ends, it's, like I mentioned in the beginning, it's a very sad episode. And they do a good job with building it up yeah. to, to that point, too. Yeah. Uh, but we'll save that stuff for our final thoughts. The surprising part here, for me, is it's how it started out. It was kind of slapsticky. Right. With Swytek yeah. kind of being like doing the Shaft song. And you know? also them being like playing around with each other. Like, hey, Tubbs is like, hey, I'll be there. You know, by the time I get my my story read, 
Yeah. You have them in cuffs. Don't worry. It's no big yeah. deal. You know. And, and then it's super dark when we get to the end. I know. And this is the first episode where, I mean, I know you guys are always joking about how they lose people all the time. But this is the first episode where it's really been like Crockett's really sad that mm-hmm. they have lost somebody. You know what? The last time we had something like this was when we had those two kids from New York oh, that were that moving drugs. Too yeah. really hard too. They, they were young kids, not mm-hmm. this young, but, but they younger. were. You know, yeah, yeah, they, they, they were, were in their twenties and they were stupid kids, basically. Mm-hmm. And they were, and he took it really hard because they. Would, it's another one of the things like he did it what he was supposed to do. He was he on was his way out. out. He did all this work. Crockett did all this work to like help these kids, those mm-hmm. other kids, and then they were going to get out and everything would be fine. And then he died. <laughs> My advice, damn you. <laughs> Well, we have many more, many, many more final thoughts on that. Let's first cover the music in this episode and we'll come back. So as I mentioned, having to fill in for John for the guest stars, I'm going to have to fill in for John for music. So this is going to be a very short music segment in comparison to what John's able to put forward for our Vice episodes is very thorough. Talk about how, because we know from Miami Vice, how important the music is now. I cannot do the type of research that John does. He is able to find amazing stuff about our music guests that, that yes. come on during these episodes. I did a look at our music that make an appearance in this, but I'm going to be very short in music by comparison. And as I mentioned earlier in the episode, maybe John will come back and we'll have a supplementary add-on for this episode where John can give his breakdown on yeah, this music. Like his own, uh... Our first song that appeared in this episode is condemned by the band One Way. Now, this is the only band that I really have information on. The band was like an R&B and funk band through the 70s, all the way through the 80s, and then into the early 90s. It was founded by Al Hudson. Now, it was always like Al Hudson. So the band's name previously was Al Hudson and the Soul Partners. (laughs) And then it became One Way, and then it became One Way featuring Al Hudson. So I think I'm pretty sure the person, the main person behind the music was a guy named Al Hudson. I think so, too. (laughs) He made sure his name was in there, though. (laughs) They had 11 albums as just as one way. So just as one way, they had 11 albums. They had a whole bunch of other albums as Al Hudson and the Soul Partners. And then they had a few more albums as um, in their um, greatest hits that came out in the mid 90s. They released a lot of music. Their top selling album was Who's Fooling Who, which came out in 1982. And the top song on there was a song called Cutie Pie. They pretty much consistently had songs from every one of their albums make it into the Billboard 200 for R&B and for dance and for funk. So they were actually a really successful band. It's actually kind of hard to find music from them. Which is really weird. They had so many albums. I've never heard of them, and I don't even know. Yeah, yeah, they were consistently in the seventies and the eighties, always at the top of R and B and funk. But I'm with you. I've never heard of them. Well, that's strange. Why can't you find their music? I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. There's some out there. The only, which is weird, even on their Wikipedia page, the only album that had more information was this one. It's who's Who's fooling who? That name's funny though. <laughs> who's fooling who? Because <laughs> it was the only song. It's just the album that had their top single on it. But otherwise, there wasn't even Wikipedia pages for their other albums. And if you look at the sales from their other albums, they're like in the top 50 of R&B albums hmm. from the 70s. So, Weird. yeah, it's really strange. And so we'll have to count on John maybe yeah, to come back come later and do something. some more research on Although, that. Although, if he doesn't, he'll be frustrated. Those ones frustrate <laughs> him when it's not, there's no information. <laughs> this song, though, Condemned, was from the 1985 album, Wrap Your Body, which has a fantastic cover, by the way. <laughs> well, I mean, with a name like Wrap Your Body. Okay, it's like a um, pers- a naked person in a bed with a sheet ah. tucked in so you very you accentuate their body ah. parts. <laughs> no wonder you liked it. Let me guess. It was a female. That was <laughs> this song is from the B-side of that album, so it's actually a pretty deep track. This is not this is a deep cut from Miami Vice to the song in, in this episode. So it's kind of like, good job, Miami Vice. Yeah, you, like, you found that. <laughs> you didn't just pick a radio hit. Yeah, you actually exactly. went deep on this one. Our next song, and actually I'm going to combine our next two songs together. The next two songs are How Much Did You Get For Your Soul by The Pretenders. That's a very weird song. <laughs> Both of these songs are very strange, actually. Because the other song is Picture Book by Simply Red. I like that song, but... The Pretenders one is strange because it doesn't sound like anything other anything else that the Pretenders have done. Mm-hmm. It sounded very much like Soul mm-hmm. and the way she's like talking in it and there's someone answering her back and stuff in the mm-hmm. song. It's very mm-hmm. strange. Well, I'm going to defer 
To John. The to expert. John on this. And I'm not even going to defer to John for you have to wait for it. I'm going to defer to John to say, go listen to Go With The Heat episode 49. In that episode, it's season two, episode 21 of Miami Vice, the episode Trust Fund Pirates. Go listen to that episode. And there's John a deep, there's a has a deep, deep dive yeah. into both The Pretenders and Simply Red, he who does. both made an appearance in that episode. I remember The Pretenders especially. Go back and listen to that because there is a deep history into The Pretenders and Simply Red. Yep. There is nothing that I can put in here that John exactly. did not dig up on those two <laughs> bands. So I encourage you, go back and listen to episode 49 of Go With The Heat, Trust Fund Pirates. You will get all of the information that you need about the pretenders and simply read. And that's going to do it for music this week. I told you it's going to be really short. Yeah. Because I just can't compete. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> John is our resident music expert. So. Yes. So let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. So I'll kick off. It's just the two of us. I'll kick off for final thoughts on this episode um as i alluded to in our episode rundown this was a really good episode it was dark it was twisted we took a long winding road and when you get to the like you're just kind of feeling like everything is going along okay then you just get punched right in the gut mm -hmm. when you get to the end of this episode i actually haven't felt this upset about how you lose a character in an episode in a long time i've kind of been ambivalent about the the people the, the other people who have died in our most recent episodes like eh, okay we know that these people like all oh, the setups here they're gonna kill this but none of these people are gonna make it out alive but they've all been real bad criminals this had a the wire kind of feel to I it i know it did didn't especially it? the second season where it's all about the kids in mm -hmm. the streets of baltimore so this had a very strong feeling you know, i like can't that. handle emotionally <laughs> handle <laughs> I'm still not over Michael B. Jordan dying in the wire. Sorry if I just spoiled that, but <laughs> it was a long time ago. You should have already watched it by now. <laughs> Wallace, I loved you. <laughs> this this felt very much like that. Mm -hmm. And you felt really bad for Archie. And man, is it a gut punch when you see what's going to happen to him when he doesn't back out. So with that scene at the school and it's this long drawn out where he's refusing to listen to anyone else and you know you like, you just know this is a death sentence. So you're just watching it happen in slow motion and then when he gets the confession out of Walker you think like maybe there's a chance. Yeah. Maybe there's a chance they're going to come in at the last second and they're going to save him but nope he dies. Yeah. And so it really is gut wrenching to get through this episode. I was a big fan of it. Melissa what are your final thoughts? I am a big fan of it but it really I it, it gets me in the emotions <laughs> right in the emotional. No. Yeah like there's only been there's only a handful of episodes of Miami Vice where I have been, like actually really cried and been like upset. Some of it I mean sometimes it's like tongue in cheek and you're right you don't really get that invested in them because you don't get that long. I guess the only other one where I didn't cry, but it was sad. And I don't know why is that one where it's, um, I never know their names, but the one where it's Crockett's ex flame and she's got the gambling debts mm -hmm. and you think like, Oh no, she's going to be okay because she, they've worked it out and they're helping her and then they kill her mm -hmm. and her husband is all upset and distraught. Like it's upsetting, but no, I, I cried in this episode because you know, like you, you're right. You think in the beginning, like this kid's not going to make it out. But then you start to go through like, no, he's going to be OK. Like he's done. He's done his part. Everything is going to be OK. And then look, he got the confession. Maybe that, that there's no way they're not going to get in there in time to save him. And then they mm -hmm. don't. And then it, 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 it there's Crockett being emotional and he's like visibly sad because he didn't do it. It wasn't his fault. He tried mm -hmm. to stop him. He just had to sit back and watch it happen, yeah. which is hard. And then, yeah, and then there's just the part where they go and you can see that, you know, Ed is visibly upset because he knew it was going to happen. And he, same thing with him. He had to just watch it happen. And it, he, there's nothing they could do about it. Quite the follow up to our walk alone episode last week. So yes. I was really hoping that we weren't going to have like back to back rough episodes because and, and I give Miami Vice a pass on when they have bad episodes. It's a much different landscape in the 80s when it comes to TV because you have 24 episodes and mm -hmm. you absolutely have to fill them. Not like modern days where you yeah. go to a streaming platform. If you only have 17 episodes, then you only got 17. And exactly. Then, only, some, of, some stuff now, they only have 11 or 12. So yeah. you're going to get episodes where like this. We really didn't have a whole episode here, but we got to put one out. Yeah. And <laughs> also, like because some of it, I feel like some of it, it was like, still a throwback to that ridiculousness that was like the prior season. So they're mm -hmm. like, this is ridiculous. Like Tubbs could never go into a prison undercover and do all this crap and it would never really work, but we're going to do it anyway. You know, I have to say this is not the saddest episode of season three. <laughs> so you're in for it. I'm, I, I'm aware of how season three is going to go. And if this, 
so far, season three has started off so strong that I, I, the further we get along, Walk Alone was actually something that was nice. It was like, okay, maybe it won't be so serious. Maybe it's sad, but it's not as sad. But then the further we get into se- season three, it's like, oh, man, they're really going to gut punch you mm-hmm. when, when you get there. It's Yeah, mm-hmm. it's an emotional gut punch. There's nothing yeah. else to do. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. As you could tell, we really enjoyed this episode. This is a strong episode yes, to go in to uh, encourage you if you're listening to the show and you're not watching along with us to go at least go back and check out this episode we would also encourage you to go to your pod catcher of choice your podcast platform of choice and go leave us a review and you know what give us the top rating that that <laughs> I'm ask for it. <laughs> yeah just give us the top rating don't leave a review for the show just tell us what your favorite episode is from season three don't bother writing a review no one actually reads the reviews anyway just go ahead and give us five stars or a thumbs up or a Three fish or whatever the hell the podcast. Three chili peppers. <laughs> gives for their highest rating. It helps people find the show. It helps them discover the greatness that is Miami Vice. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. You can go to that website, go with the heat.com, click on about us. You can find all the ways to contact us. You can find all the ways to contact us individually. We would, you can also see all the places that you can subscribe to the show. Traditional RSS, iTunes, Google Music, YouTube, TuneIn. You can pretty much find us anywhere podcasts are found. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.